is uh, for the Brendans. And uh, subject matter, Joshua and the fall of Jericho. We're going to be taking a kind of, a, I'll say, a different approach to this than is usually uh, exp uh, the typical explanation. You're all familiar with the account. Uh, who knows what book of the Bible that account is found in? Sister Karen. <laughs> Joshua. Joshua, yeah, he has his own, he has his own book. Um, anyway, we are asking uh, Sister Robin Armstrong, she's going to be our banner for the day. She's going to be writing up on the, uh, on the whiteboards here. We have, a lot, yeah, we have a lot of writing to do. She actually has a really good penmanship. This is her, uh, that's a lot better than I do, chicken scratch. So, um, we'll briefly cover what the traditional explanation for the surrounding of and the subsequent fall of Jericho is, uh, is describing. And I'll say in a nutshell, in 120 seconds or less, I'm going to ask, uh, let's see here, we have many erudite brethren. Let's ask Brother Rick if he can give us the basic understanding or the synopsis of the pastor's teaching and what we've generally accepted as the uh, interpretation of the Jericho picture if uh, he can kind of give us a, a quick rundown. Uh, you don't need to get into specifics, Brother Rick. But you can if you'd like. Go ahead. Oh. Well, in a very poor fashion, the first six days uh, as they trumpeted once around the city, uh, yet on the seventh day, they trumpeted seven times. And during the uh, seventh, uh, you know, after the seventh trumpets, the great shout, and the city walls fell, the city represents Babylon, and some of the, uh, the, the thinking has been that in the uh, seventh stage of the church, the Laodicean period uh, after um, judgment has been rendered on uh, the spiritual Babylon Christendom, that different things might be pictured such as the seven trumpet blast as uh, seven last plagues, uh, bringing about each one, you know, uh, truth message in a sense. Um, some have likened it as well as being um, aligned with the uh, Elijah smiting Jordan crossing over and things. But some of it, uh, that's a very simple, straightforward way of looking at it. What about the, uh, the first six days? What is that generally? It's a seven day picture, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, the first six days, uh, the single circuits, trumpet blowing, silenced by the masses. And we're going to actually get into the verses uh, momentarily here, but what is the general explanation uh, for the entire seven day period, especially the first, let's say the, uh, you mentioned the seven, but the first six days were just single circuits. Well, that might align with the um, six previous trumpet messengers uh, outline. It's, uh, it would synchronize closely with the um, six divisions of the uh, messages to the church and their messengers, each company for putting forth the message previous, and then it culminates uh, in the seventh with the seventh. Okay. Uh, so essentially, it as a picture, I think the, I think the general understanding is, and, and if you could confirm this for me, Brother Rick, that it's a, it's a, it spans the entire gospel age. That's the general, is that the general accepted understanding? I would think so. Okay, so the seven stages of the gospel. And it seems like a very, I'll say, convenient fit, like a very uh, nice fit numbers-wise. Uh, there's a symmetry to it that seems to be, um, uh, you know, it, it, I'll say it, it, we don't like loose ends. And it seems to uh, take care of that for us. Uh, now, what we're going to do is we're actually going to raise more questions than give answers. This is not a discourse. This is very, very much uh, an interactive study. So we're going to depend upon, hopefully, a collective group think and fill in some blanks that are left by the current understanding of the current interpretation of the thinking that this spans the entire gospel age. We won't say what we think it is up front because I think um, there's more detail to be fleshed out before we come to any 
perhaps alternate conclusion than what we've always accepted as being uh, generally the uh, acceptable interpretation as far as Bible students are concerned. So let's do this. First, we need to establish a little bit of a, uh, uh, a placement in time. We need a starting point for the uh, count of Joshua and the fall of Jericho. Uh, now, the fall of Jericho doesn't actually happen until the sixth chapter. There are five chapters that precede that, obviously, if you're any good at math. And that, that will lay the framework for where we are thinking the timing of this picture actually begins. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to skip around a little bit. We're going to go into great detail in chapter 6, but we're going to flesh out some details uh, ahead of that. So let's start right at the beginning of Jericho. I'm sorry, Joshua. Um, verses, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Who has uh, Joshua up? Either on their computer or on their uh, sister Bernadette. Verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1. Chapter 1. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all, and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. All right. What's the salient point here? What's the overriding point of verses 1 and 2? What's happened? Moses. Brother uh, Michael. That the leader of Israel, Moses, has passed on and it seems like Joshua is going to fill his group. Moses is dead. He says it twice, after the death of Moses, and then he says in verse 2, my servant Moses is dead. Um, just as an in, a little bit of an interesting aside, why is... Uh, God telling Joshua this? They didn't find his body. Okay. They didn't find his body, but in reality, they didn't, they didn't really know what happened to him. So it needed to be spelled out for Joshua. Moses is dead. He's not coming back. I didn't send him on vacation. He's not on sabbatical. He's dead. Um, we know why. We won't get into that, but that's our first point. So this is we're establishing a bit of a timeline here. So, death of Moses, Moses is dead. Uh, verse 5. Sister Bernice, why don't you read that for us as well? There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. All right. What's the point? What just happened? Sister Karen. The mantle was passed. The mantle was passed. The mantle was passed. It went from Moses, who was a type of? Christ. Yeah, Christ, the Christ. Um, and now it's passed on to Joshua. Uh, so... Let's say mantle pad, whatever you want to call it. So he says, as I was dealing with Moses, now I'm dealing with you. And we know that in many instances, Joshua refers back to, as Jehovah commanded Moses and told Moses this and did that, it's come to pass. This has happened. As Moses, as Moses. Joshua frequently refers back to Moses and the commands that were given to Moses, which were passed along to Joshua. What does this sound like? in other pictures. Someone other than Karen. Uh, Brother Russell. Uh, Elijah to Elisha. Elijah to Elisha. And we have other pictures where the church, once that church class is finished on this side of the veil, everything that was the church's responsibility now becomes the great multitude's responsibility. All right. We won't read the scriptures, but in again in the first chapter in verses 6 and verse 7, verse 9, Jehovah tells Joshua 
He encourages him. He um, uh, strengthens him. And he says, be strong and of good courage. Multiple times. He keeps telling Joshua. Moses is gone. You can sense that Joshua is, a, is he's a, like a reluctant, you know, he's not looking for the captain's chair. He didn't want the captain's chair. He was Moses' right-hand man. He relied upon Moses for just about everything, and he realized fully who Moses was. He was Jehovah's servant. So now he's in, he doesn't have Moses. He's, you know, the, the buck stops with Joshua. And God is trying to comfort him, to give him, um, you know, edify him and say, I'm with you, so be strong and be of good courage. And he, he reiterates it multiple times in rapid succession. Uh, let's go now to chapter 2. 2 verse 1. Let's read 1 through 4. And we'll ask uh, <coughs> Sister Susie to do that for us. Okay, <laughs> okay. sorry. This, this is from the ISV. I haven't screened it. 2 verses 1 through 4? Yes. After this, Nun's son Joshua sent two men from the acacia groves as undercover scouts. He told them, go and look over the land. Pay special attention to Jericho. So they went out, came to the house of a prostitute named Graham, and lodged there. Then the king of Jericho was told, look, Israeli men arrived tonight to scout out the land. So the king of Jericho sent for Rahab and ordered her, bring out the men who came to visit you and lodged in your house because they've come to scout out the entire land. Now the woman had taken the two men and hid them. So she replied, the men really did come to me, but I don't know from where they came. Okay. All right. What picture does this? These two men go into the city. In another place in uh, the book of Joshua, when we get to chapter 6, it actually calls them messengers. Isn't that interesting? It doesn't call them spies. It calls them messengers. What's the message? What's the frequent, uh, uh, I'll say, uh, synonym used that we often translate into the word messenger? Angel. Angel. So what is it? So two go in. And they're hidden by Rahab. What does this look like? What what other picture in Scripture does this sound an awful lot like? Sister Rob. Lot. Lot. Okay, lot. Isn't that interesting? I mean, look at the facets, the things that happen that are very, very similar to the Jericho picture and the Sodom and Gomorrah picture. And we see two spies slash messengers go in in Jericho and two angels slash, mess slash messengers go into Sodom for Lot. Uh, and then there's a, a whole subsequent interaction between Rahab and the two spies and Lot and the two angels. Uh, the details are, I'll say, are strikingly similar. similar. Uh, in the Lot picture, when does that picture actually take place. Where is the church when Lot is rescued from Sodom and Gomorrah and Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed? Where is the church antitypically or in picture at, at, at that time? Uh, Sister Rob? Afar off. Afar off. Abraham. Uh, meaning, what's, our, what's the implication? Heaven. He heaven. It means that the church is off the scene. They're not on the scene for the destruction of Babylon, are they? I mean, not in the flesh, I should say. We do think they're on the scene, and they're uh, uh, appreciably responsible, uh, the Christ head and body, for the destruction of Babylon. But they're on the other side of the veil. The church class is complete at that time. OK, so we've discussed the similarities between Rahab and Lot. Uh, we won't get into detail with regard to Rahab and her chosen profession, but just to, I'll say, uh, is there an alternate, let's say, understanding uh, for Rahab as far as uh, this whole uh, prostitution slash harlot slash 
is is there some is there a different understanding? I mean, normally it's uh, uh, normally we just say she's the, the harlot Rahab is what we call her, uh, Sister Bernice. Um, wasn't uh, Jesus lying came from Rahab? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And what we're asking is uh, many commentators, Sister Karen. To the innkeeper. Innkeeper. They actually, many commentaries actually translate that word as innkeeper. However, I will say, in the New Testament, when Rahab comes up, what's the Greek word used to, I'm going to ask Brother Richard, used to describe Rahab? Porne. Porne. That's obviously where we get our current word, pornography. Uh, or porn from, so it is it, it is something that's carried into the New Testament as being a, a derogatory, uh, a negative, uh, uh, let's say, uh, connotation. So the point being that Rahab is in Jericho. She's essentially part of that system, but her response to the two that are sent gains her special favor. And ultimately, when we get into the account in chapter 6, we'll see many more details that bring uh, many more questions into this picture here. So we have uh, two spies versus two angels. I don't know if you have that uh, up there. Okay, good. Um, Rahab slash Lot, another similarity in these two pictures. Um, Rahab hides the spies, and what does Lot do with the angels that come? The men, I should say, that come, because he doesn't know they're angels at that time. Uh, Sister Bernice. He brought them in his own house and, and um, actually he didn't want them to stay out in the uh, city because I think they met, he met them at the gate. Or they met him at the gate. And he wanted to bring them into his home. He didn't want them to stay in the city outside. So he hid them. That's right. He hid them. But they knew some people saw that he, they were there and they came and wanted the two men that Lot took into his house. Well, in chapter two, what happens here? Rahab takes the two men into her house, and what happens? What's that? She hides them, but what, what ha what ha why does she have to hide them? What happens when they... The when king wants them. Yeah, the king wants them. They come to her and say, hey, what'd you do with those two guys? They, how, side by side, is this picture with the Lot, Sodom, and Gomorrah picture. There's so many similarities, it's impossible, and I, I don't think anyone denies that Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, pictures of destruction of Babylon, and perhaps, the, you know, the daughter systems, or even greater, you know, all of nominal Christianity, and that Jericho also pictures the destruction of Babylon. So obviously, there would be an alignment. That shouldn't be anything that's uh, startling. But what we are talking about here is the timing and the picture, what the circles really mean and when those actually start. Because when do the circles start? Before or after the, the encounter with the spies? After. After. After the encounter with the spies. So if the spies have anything uh, are, are in relation, we'll count again, how many days is it between the visit of the spies and Israel crossing Jordan? Does anyone remember off the top of there? Uh, Sister Bernice. Three. Three days. It's three days between the time the spies our head, and now let's get into that actually a little bit here. Uh, still in chapter two, let's, she hides them up on the roof. We have to kind of skip a little bit here. There's a lot of, you know, we obviously can't digest six full chapters of reading in a 90 minute period of time and come out with uh, some explanations or even more questions, as it were. Um, but she hides them on the roof. Then she explains to them that, you know, our hearts did melt when we saw you guys appear at Jordan. We've heard all the stories. While you were in the wilderness, we heard about the Red Sea in Egypt. We heard about 
uh, how you killed off all the, you know, the giants and the Anakims, and we heard all these things, and then poof, you're just on the other side of the river. We can see your big horde, uh, and our hearts melted. We're really, you know, people here are really, really afraid of what's going to happen next. That now that you're on the scene, so she tells them all this, and let's go to verse 12. Let's read 12 through 16, and we'll ask. Um, let's see, Sister Sony, if she can do that. Sister Sonia, sorry. I Verses 12 through uh, 16, I'm reading from the New American Standard. Now therefore, please swear to me by the Lord, since I have dealt kindly with you, that you also will deal kindly with me and my father's household, and give me a pledge of truth, and spare my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters, and all excuse me, with all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. So the men said to her, our life for yours, if you do not tell this business of ours. And it shall come about when the Lord gives us the land that we will deal kindly with, kindly and faithfully with you. Then she said, let them down by, then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall, and she was living on the wall. She said to them, Go to the hill country, so that the per pursuers will not happen upon you, and hide yourselves there for three days until the pursuers return. Then afterward, you may go on your way. All right. Uh, also read verse 18. Verse 18. Unless when we come unto the land, you tie this cord of scarlet thread in the window through which you will let, let us down and gather yourselves into the house, of your father and your mother and your brothers and all your father's household. Okay, actually, and I'll have you read one more, 19 as well. Sorry. Oh, I can't do it. <laughs> it shall come about that anyone who goes out of the door of your house into the streets, his blood shall be on his own head, and we shall be free. But anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head if any, is laid, if, if any hand is laid on him. Okay. What does that sound like? Stay under the scarlet thread. If you go out of the house, your 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 life's in your own hands. Uh, Sister Carrie. That's the same as the Passover when they had to put the red blood on the doorpost lentils. Stay in that house. Yeah. That you, thing, okay. you came out from under that blood. Well, that that was it. You know, your your life was in your own hands. Uh, just out of uh, curiosity, when was this? When did this happen? Sister Karen. They, well, just before they go in, they celebrate Passover. Well, actually, they go in and celebrate Passover, and then they go and take Jericho. And guess what? So 40 years to the day, they enter, they cross Jericho. We'll, we will actually get into the, the scriptures of that a little bit. They celebrated their very first Passover, the actual passing over in Egypt the night of the Exodus. This is 40 years to the day of that celebrating the Passover that they cross over and immediately they celebrate Passover. And then they, then they go through a recircumcision because they were in the wilderness for 40 years and circumcision stopped while they were out there. They stopped. So, and those scriptures are in there as well. These are all really interesting points. I think many of them are tied into our uh, what's necessary for us to understand or come to a full understanding of what this account means because we have three days uh, Just on real quick. Uh, the, well, no actually brother because this will take it into another thought that uh, brother Rick I'm Just gonna say that that scripture you're referring to uh, Joshua 419 and the people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and, and encamped in Gilgal on the east border of, of Jericho Okay and the tenth day of the first month was generally uh, what they what did they do on the tenth day of the first month? Uh, Sister Karen. They take the lamb. They take the lamb. That's when they take the lamb. Uh, and then on the fourteenth they celebrate the Passover. And I think a few verses later it even says it. it says they and they you know celebrated the Passover. 
and then they went through the circumcision, and uh, a few days after that, they began with uh, Jericho, which again, we'll get into those things. Uh, okay, so it's Passover. I don't know if you wrote that down or not, but it's 40 years to the day when they cross over. Uh, Sister Carrie. Well, maybe I'm premature. I just want to know if you're going to explain or ask talk about the three days, what significance they have. I was have. just and about to ask that I question. figured you were, and why was it immediately after the three days that they started the circling around? Okay. Uh, it was three days for the spies to uh, get back, because they, the at Rahab's uh, behest or recommendation or what have you, uh, because we have to brush over some of these facts due to the paucity of time to really get into it, they arrive at Jordan. God says, guess what? Three days from today, you're going to cross this river. You're going to set foot in the land, and it's going to be yours forever. And no one's going to kick you out, as it were. Uh, granted, if they obey. <laughs> and they certainly didn't always. Um, that, during that three days, right then also began the time when the spies went into Jericho. And they had to hide out for that three days. So they came back. And as soon as they came back, that's when God said, OK, get up, do this with the ark, stop the Jordan, which is another point where we're, we're going to have to address the, the stoppage of the Jordan uh, and the similarities to the uh, uh, you know what, what the stoppage of the Jordan port. Also, the names of the towns. We've got Jordan. They start at Jordan. Gilgal, Jericho. What does this sound like? What are what other what other uh, couplet do these? Yeah, somebody for the for the for the record, uh, bro, uh, brother Rick. Uh, sounds like the Elijah Elijah shows they traveled. Yeah. Second piece. Ironically, it's in reverse. Isn't that interesting? It's kind of a reverse order of things. Uh, it starts at Jordan, where Elijah and Elisha, when they're together, they end at Jordan. However, when Elisha on the other side, after Elijah disappears, what happens? Elisha has to come back now, and his journey starts at somebody. Jordan. Jordan. OK. Elisha's journey starts at Jordan. Joshua's journey and the, the uh, nation of Israel start at Jordan after the church is off the scene in the Elisha picture. All right, three days. Isn't this interesting? Where else does this uh, three days show up between um, uh, Sister Karen? The sons of the prophets searched three days for the body of Elijah, and I think it also correlates to when the women come to the tomb and the angel says, whom seek ye? So there's a searching there too. Okay, so we have a couple of, actually even more than that, but we have a couple of other pictures where once the church is off the scene, there's this interim period of three days where there's a, uh, I'll say it's a period of adjustment, it's a period of, of searching, it's a period of, uh, uh, of information gathering because when the church is off the scene the great multitude needs to needs a, a little bit of an adjustment period in order to uh, right the ship as it were they're in a, a state of uh, despondency uh, in that in other pictures in um, we've gone into great detail in previous uh, studies and you know, study weekends, uh, explaining the various types between, uh, especially trying to enumerate what happens with the great multitude, when, what they're responsible for, a number of things, and trying to bring out more detail about Lot and daughters, Elisha and sons of the prophets, Jesus and the disciples. You know, in that, in that picture we think, and we brought it out plenty of times, that the disciples, the apostles, the 11, actually represent the great multitude when Jesus represents the church. Because what, what does it say when Jesus was apprehended? What did the 11 do? What's the actual verse quote? Forsook him and fled, the 11. But 
there's a subset even there. So again, we have what we just mentioned, Lot and his daughters. We have Elisha and the sons of the prophets. And now we have the three disciples that were closest to Jesus, Peter, James, and John, and the other eight who weren't quite as close. So there, there's a subset of the great multitude that we would argue have present truth. Uh, we've mentioned this plenty of times before. Sister Robin. Are there two three-day periods that you're talking about? One from the time that they reached Jordan to the time they send the spies to Jericho, and then three days after the spies leave Jericho and hide in the woods? Or? No, it's all. this all is happening concurrently. If you uh, read the account, uh, you can. it's easy to actually also get that idea that there are two three-day periods. But it's not. These things, and that's part of the... Um, the problem because when you go ahead now into uh, Joshua, it actually refers to things that happened like a little bit earlier. Um, and we'll see that as we get through them here. Let me, uh, 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 Brother Rick. Uh, just on that, I was uh, had a question. Um, was I, the King James might not bear it out very well, and I hadn't considered it before. In the uh, third chapter, verse 2. It came to pass after three days that the officers went out uh, through the host and commanded the people, telling them about following the ark when it moved. And then in verse 5, Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And, uh, and then it moves forward. Is the morrow the third year, or is the morrow, I'm sorry, the third day? I haven't said that long. Or is it actually after? Three days and it ends up being the fourth. Now I, I tend to think it's the uh, third day. That's inclusive. We, we, I, I'll say we find this frequently in scriptures, and that's why we often use uh, with regard to Jesus in the tomb. We insert for for a mental check, as it were. Uh, what do we say when he says when Jesus was in the tomb three days and three nights? What do, what do we do to those verses? What words do we insert? Uh, parts of, parts of, uh, and it's the same thing here that it's difficult sometimes to follow because it's uh, a little bit ambiguous when it's mentioned. But uh, it does say that on the tenth day that they crossed over Jordan, they entered the land. So the moment the the first Israelite stepped out of the the dry Jordan and stepped onto uh, so the soil of Canaan, you know, as it were, um, that was the fulfillment. That was, and then the rest, of course, uh, followed behind. Uh, you had mentioned that, the three days, so we have that on the, the uh, uh, and again, I think those three days are concurrent with the time that the spies are gone, because they come back, and you'll see in a moment here, that the, uh, the, when the spies come back is when the Lord tells them, okay, now let's go. You know, it's time to go over. Uh, Rahab. What's kind of unique about the Rahab account? This is a little bit more of a nebulous question. How does Rahab refer to Israel's God? Does she say your God? You know, we know, we've heard that your God does these things. Or, and the answer lies in Joshua 2, verse 9. And let's have, uh, let's see here. Let's have uh, Sister Bernice read that for us. Since Karen's there with the microphone. Chapter, I mean, chapter 2, verse 9. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord has Okay, given stop, stop right there. Uh, actually, say the, say the real word that's there. Jehovah. Okay, Jehovah. Okay. Sorry. That's, no, that's fine. That's, that's, uh, that's an unfortunate translational error, but, you know, we live with it. <laughs> and she said unto the men, I know that the Jehovah hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that... All the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. Okay. So, and she also mentions the name in the, uh, in the succeeding verse as well, in verse 10. So she's actually using 
uh, a familiar, the actual name of Israel's God, Jehovah or Yahweh, or, uh, or the Tetragrammaton, um, which is an interesting point, I think, because she's a foreigner. She's not a Jew. She hasn't had any exposure to their religion. She's just heard things. But based upon the paucity of knowledge, of understanding that she has, she is still favorably disposed to their God, to them and their God. So she has no reason to doubt that what's coming. She, she fully understands. And her overriding concern is what? In verse 12, she's concerned for her father's household, her entire family, her brothers, sisters, you know, father, etc. That's her concern. Uh, who gets saved in the Lot picture? Lot and his household, and his house. Um, so again, concern for her family. And then, of course, we read the scarlet thread, the window, the Passover uh, interrelationship there. Uh, Brother Rick has read uh, chapter 3, verse 2, which talks about the three days. Let's go to verse 16 in chapter 3. We'll read 16 and 17. And we will have Brother Mike Buckner do that for us, if he's able. At the water which came down from above, stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city Adam, that is, besides Zarethan. And those who came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, uh, failed and were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. All right. So they passed clean over, all the people passed clean over Jordan. That's another bullet point. And there are interesting details in here, which I, I love the detail that the scriptures provide on so many issues because it's like why would you provide that level of, why would you give the names of places and where the uh, whatever happened to cause the stoppage where that happened and you know all these details that to me adds uh, authenticity to the account just as a, a side note I'll say but we've got not very far from the city of Adam which by the way is the same because it's, uh, it's the same word as, uh, as Adam in the original word, back in Genesis. Um, if anyone has any ideas on that, why, why did it happen in the city of Adam? Any thoughts, or just keep that in mind? Uh, the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant stood firm on dry ground. So Jordan is Elijah. That would be our submission for thought. Anything, any other thoughts on that? Any thought, Brother uh, Rick? Does, does, oh, yeah, thanks. Uh, just thinking out loud, we've got the Ark of the Covenant with the priests in the water, and now it's not the water, it's dry. Mm -hmm. And then the people passing over uh, with the timing um, that's being suggested, uh, and maybe just jumping ahead, so I'm happy to wait, but what would they seem to, how would they fit into this if we're looking at a great company picture, future after the little plot is complete on the other side of the veil? Okay, um, I would ask that question as well. What if, if there is a, we're looking at unusual timing here, so uh, Sister Carrie. Well, my comment is only based on Brother Frank's um, study notes, um, being the Jordan, he says the Jordan River represents death and being judged down. So um, he's suggesting that um, the reason why um, the, the sin offering is complete at this point in time. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> that's <laughs> actually, no, that's a, that's a really good, uh, that's a really good, I'll say, um, uh, explanation. And I'm glad you brought that out. That if the sin offering is complete at that time, by default, what does that also mean? Uh, 
Sister Bernice? Church is gone. Okay, church is gone. Yeah, I, I hear like the mumbling church is gone, you know, under the, under the breath. Go ahead, raise your hand. We're, we're looking for as much interaction as, as possible. That's an interesting point. If the passing over Jordan represents the completion of the church, which I would have absolutely no <coughs> argument or problem with, then the Jericho picture, the seven days that uh, uh, essentially, it, it takes place a little bit more uh, longer after that because we have Passover and we have circumcision, but then that's only a few days of uh, intervening. Um, but now when we get to the Jericho picture, that also, I would say, gives us uh, a little more evidence, if you want to call it that, or a little, perhaps a little more support that this is, uh, in its entirety, the Jericho chapter 6 picture, is still a future event, that the circling has not begun. Because we have, we have a couple of options here. And the options are, we can treat it as an isolated uh, picture, chapter 6. We can separate it from the, the preceding five chapters. In my estimation, and this is our, this would be our assertion, I, I don't think that does the picture any favors as far as the timing is concerned. Um, that's just my thinking on it. If we do, then everything we've been reading is irrelevant to the actual picture. Because these things, as I think have been kind of established, the crossing over Jordan especially, uh, represent some kind of change in uh, either nature or dispensation or whatever you want to call it. And if that's the case, if we continue on that chronological track, then we're placing the Jericho picture subsequent to those events. If not, then we, like I said, we're, we're completely disregarding the first five chapters. Uh, and I, again, I, I don't like the thought of having to uh, you know, disregard those chapters myself. Uh, okay, any other questions, thoughts, comments? Because we brought a lot of things up, not a whole lot of answers, I'll say, just a lot of similarities in what's happening to especially the Lot picture and to Elijah and Elisha. Those two pictures seem to be heavily uh, um, coincidental to what we're reading now. Brother Rick. Uh, I find it really interesting what you're bringing out, and I hadn't made the correlations between the two spies and the, um, and the Lot picture, so I'm, I'm looking, you know, that's a blessing, and I'm looking forward to more. But I'll, I'll say in, you know, how I previously uh, just looked at it, not with that kind of detail, but the, I did separate the circling of the city as, a, as a, its own picture, uh, type of picture, of uh, what was previously you know, outlined briefly at the beginning. And, but this I looked at as the, the ark and the priests in Jordan demonstrating that the 144,000 were complete and uh, that they had passed from uh, flesh into the spirit realm. And then that would pave the way for the people, Israel, but picturing the world then to flow into, as it were, the promised land of uh, the kingdom that follows thereafter in a, in a more generalized. It doesn't do anything with dealing with the two spies and the pictures like you're bringing out. But just to say that, that's how I've more often looked at that. So. Yeah, and I'll say that as far as uh, I'm concerned, that, that's been my general take on the picture itself until fairly recently. Actually, we, the, the reason this came up is because we studied the book of Joshua on our uh, Wednesday night, was it Wednesday night? Yeah, our Wednesday night study uh, at Huntsville fairly recently, and we just got through it uh, just not too many months ago. And it, going into those details, brought up a lot of questions, and then all of a sudden, seeing these similarities, the two, because again, those two spies, they go in, and all that interaction happens before Israel even crosses Jordan. So you've got to let that go, that spy interaction. But that is directly responsible for the salvation of Rahab and her household because of that scarlet thread or twine or rope or whatever you want to call it. Um, haven't read the scriptures yet, we will read them, I think. Um, but 
How does how is Jericho destroyed? How is Jericho? Who destroys Jericho? How is it destroyed? Uh, anybody but the usual cast of characters here? Okay, uh, Sister Bernice. Well, they did seven uh, loops around, and then they all shouted. They were all uh -huh. quiet while they were going around. Uh -huh. But then at the end, they made a great shout, and when they made a great shout, the walls came down. Okay, but how was Jericho destroyed? They went in and killed everyone. Okay. There, that's what I'm looking for. Who said that? Sister Carol. They burned it to the ground. Everything. With fire, they burned it. How were Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed? Burned it to the ground. Everything. Supernaturally, of course. And that's, uh, well, I, I, I want to say you know, within you know, reasonable physical parameters. Um, okay. Chapter 4, verse 19. Let's see. Sister Rochelle. Are you able to read chapter 4, verse 19 for us? Okay. And the people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal in the east border of Jericho. Okay. Came out of Jordan, or across Jordan, on the tenth day of the first month. Again, that uh, peculiar day where in the original type, Israel took the Passover lamb. That's when, not when they slew the Passover lamb, so God is counting it from um, the 10th day when the Passover lamb was actually separated out and taken. That's when they crossed over into their land. And they camped at Gilgal. That was their base of operations for a little while. That's where everything kind of uh, took place. Um, that uh, that's where they would launch their incursions from Gilgal. Gilgal is mentioned free. Sister Karen. We find out in the scripture, especially in the Elijah and Elisha picture, that Gilgal means either a revolution or a turning over. And elsewhere, the Lord says it's a new beginning. Okay. Yeah, isn't that wonderful? That just the, the meaning of the word or the name of the town or city Gilgal? Sister Karen. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing, and I was going to say, well, does that mean the turning over into the kingdom age and the ruling authority of uh, the Christ? Okay. Does the ruling authority, uh, i got to be careful how I word this, because I know there are different uh, perspectives on this. Does the Christ head and body uh, begin to reign over the earth before Babylon is destroyed. Uh, Sister Bernice, I'm sorry, honey. She keeps raising her hand, but I don't like calling on her because she knows all the answers <laughs> that I have. I don't believe so. Okay. I, yeah, I tend to th I tend to think that the uh, what I will call for the sake of those who uh, view it differently than I do personally, I will call it. Uh, reluctantly, the mediatorial reign. I don't think that happens prior to the destruction of Babylon, or begins prior to the destruction of Babylon. Uh, Sister Karen. But it could be the wedding and, and the silence. <clears throat> what could be? Whatever Carrie was talking about. <laughs> okay, I'm kind of lost, but I understand that, yeah, there's the um, I don't think even um, the, the great multitude will be on this side of the veil when that, when that uh, mediatorial reign begins. I think all the spiritual classes are, are gone. They're off the scene. I, I think from a legalistic perspective, if you want to call it that, that that needs to uh, occur before. <coughs> that's an impediment that's a, uh, before that, uh, that phase can begin. Um, I'm using these uh, words out of deference, by the way. Uh, all right. Chapter 5. Verse 2. We brought it up already, but uh, for, for time's sake, 
I'm just going to go ahead and read it. At that time, Jehovah said unto Joshua, Make thee sharp knives, and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. Sister Dawn. It's not on the second time, but it's this uh, 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 connection between Rahab and the great company. Brother Russell makes that connection. Yes, oh, he does, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, because they, uh, Rahab in that picture, even on even what ha there's the, by default would have to represent the great. So yeah, he he absolutely. I didn't mean to say that this was new thinking. It's not. Uh, I didn't yeah, mean to he, apply. he reprint forty fifty four. If anybody wants the reference, he yep. makes that he makes the reference to the antitypical Moses being the church beyond the veil, looking and seeing what's coming up ahead um, to the uh, great company who were represented by Rahab um, and the fall of Jericho being the fall of Babylon. Yes, and that's the, uh, that is also the, I'll say, impetus for the thinking that the six preceding days cannot be representative of the entire gospel age for a few reasons. One, um, Babylon didn't even exist during the first, you know, in in principle. I mean, in, in, in a, from a practical perspective, Babylon took, it wasn't really until the third messenger that it was, uh, that, you know, according to our reckoning of messengers, uh, the first two being, anybody? First two messengers. John, uh, Paul, number one. Uh, John, number two. That's the generally accepted understanding. Uh, and we're not changing that, by the way. And so I don't, I don't necessarily think that the uh, the church was circling the antitypical Jericho all throughout the the gospel age. Uh, I will introduce one possibility when we get into the account uh, momentarily here. Uh, so the nations recircumcised, which is kind of interesting, Sister Carrie. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because, um, well. The ones that were born in the wilderness are the ones that, because the other ones had died off at this time, correct? Yeah, everyone that came out of, uh, of, of course, within the the, uh, the scriptural confines of the ones who died, uh, the tribe of Levi was accepted from that arrangement, and everybody under a certain age was accepted from that arrangement, as well as, of course, uh, Joshua and Caleb were exempted, uh, individually or personally. But uh, all the rest, which I would think would comprise the bulk of the men alive at that time that they were at Jordan, uh, they, the practice of circumcision apparently ceased in the, in the uh, or was never practiced in the, um, in the wilderness during that time. So was it for to overturn the reproach of Egypt? <coughs> wow, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, verse 9 in chapter 5. Because now that reproach of Egypt, as is brought out, very good, Sister uh, Carrie. Uh, Jehovah said to Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. So remember the way most of books of the Bible were written. They were not contemporary accounts, they were recollections. They were, uh, we believe, Firmly under the holy, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, Brother Richard. Well, Brother Brendan, in line with that, that is one of the suggested reasons for the name Gilgal, because the circumcision, or in other words, the, you know, the cutting around, took place at Gilgal. Mm -hmm. So um, that's considered one of the probable reasons for giving it that name. Yeah, and it's, it was a name, obviously, according to the account, given subsequently. It wasn't named Gilgal when they were actually there. It was named something else. And I do think the name is, uh, uh, is in Scripture, and, and like now it's called Gilgal. It's somewhere. I don't recall what the, uh, the Canaanite name for it was. Um, any other thoughts on the recircumcision? What, what could that possibly be, antitypically speaking? I'll say there are a couple of possibilities. This is my own thinking. Perhaps, maybe, it has something to do with natural Israel. Um, 
Israel today is not the Israel of the kingdom. So we need to, I'll say, I don't want to say be careful of how we support natural Israel. And our Bible students are very ardent, very strong, very vociferous Zionists. And for good reason. I, I don't have any problem with that. But we do have to keep in perspective the, uh, for instance, what's, what's, a, uh, what's one name for Tel Aviv today? Brother Russ. Well, I don't know if it's a name, but it's the gay cap, one of the principal gay capitals yeah. in the world. It's one of the gay capitals. It's also known as the hedonism capital of the Middle East, oh. Tel Aviv. Named by Lonely Planet magazine. They recommend everybody visit Tel Aviv because it is a fun place to visit if you're young and single and uh, immoral. Amoral. Uh, so, uh, Again, Israel has a lot of flaws. I mean, we can, uh, today, the Israel of today. So the Israel of today is not the Israel of the kingdom. As far as governmentally, uh, the arrangement, the people even, many people are gonna find themselves on the outside. Just because you have Jewish blood does not give you certain entitlements if you're not a Jew by religion as well. Okay, that's, uh, that's a, a tangent. And over here? Uh, Brother Brian. I think if, um, when you, you're talking about the circumcision, if you just look at what the purpose of that was established for, for another way of setting Israel apart, uh, generally as well as other specific reasons. So put that in perspective to what he was trying to do with them, this recommitment, this after this 40 years, they're being penalized, a new beginning. So he wanted them to recommit. Yes. Um, verse 12. This is interesting. Let's have, uh, who's got that? Uh, Brother Rick, since you have a microphone in hand. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn or wheat of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna anymore, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Okay, so they celebrate the Passover, and then the very next day, what happens? Manna stops, which is kind of interesting. I mean, it was, it was happening right up until the very point that now, no more manna from heaven. No more bread from heaven. Indicate antitypically. Wow. Oh, okay, uh, Sister Sonia. Well, I don't know about antitypically, but I do know that now they're in the land of milk and honey, so they're not in the desert place anymore, so... There's been a change. So okay. They, so man can cease at this point. Practically speaking, in the time, yes, the the land is very um, uh, produces very bountifully, so they're not going to have a, a difficulty feeding themselves. Uh, even though they will be doing quite a bit of traveling, as we've seen, there, a lot took place leading up to this point that we've skipped over. The fact that two and a half tribes remained on one side of the border, except their fighting men. They all went. And then not only did they go, you know, Ephraim, uh, Manab, uh, Ephraim, was it Gadi? Who was it, half tribe? Uh, Manasseh. Ephraim and Manasseh, and the no, half tribe of Manasseh. Half tribe and, of Manasseh. Uh, is it Gad, Ephraim, and the half tribe? Or Reuben, Ephraim. Anyway, whatever. Uh, you understand. Sorry. Uh, but the um, point being that they, those soldiers from those tribes actually were the tip of the spear. They went ahead of Israel. Roughly, it says 40,000 of them to go ahead, uh, uh, you know, be sort of the tip of the spear and to help all their brethren get into their land, and then they could go back. And how many years, by the way, did it take for them to subdue the land? So, well, okay, Sister Karen mentioned. Does anybody have an idea? Could it be know, seven? <laughs> seven years. Okay. Uh, and, they, and we were told they didn't subdue it entirely because they left some of the inhabitants and yada yada. But the, the point is, is that it took them seven years to take control, effectively. All right. So manna stopped. And typically, I think that's very an, an interesting thing. They had to recircumcise. The manna stopped. They just celebrated the Passover. Um, and we haven't even gotten to Jericho yet. But the spies have already come out of Jericho and already had made contact with Rahab and set up that arrangement. Uh, Brother Rick. Well, it, 
um, as I said earlier, it's all uh, been loose, but kind of assorted. And they, it was, to my mind, the, uh, this would demonstrate uh, Israel and the people in the kingdom having their hearts circumcised and uh, that they are then to dedicate themselves to God under the auspices of the ancient worthies of which Joshua might be the pitcher because he is the one the Lord uses after Moses, the Christ class is gone, brings the people across um, into the, the new arrangement of uh, the, the, uh, the kingdom and that the, you know, the, the following verses here where we get to the stranger that comes who Joshua falls down before that that would probably be demonstrating the communication between the ancient worthies and the Christ and he gets his instruction from this higher authority and it continues uh, then maybe to change into this other picture but it, I had to say that you know um, that when the two spies were sent to save Rahab and her family that was as brought out it seemed to suggest that the great company came out when Babylon fell so there was that certain aspect of that that would demonstrate that there was great company in Babylon to come out when, when she fell. And that the crimson ribbon would represent that these were those who had been instructed that they could need to continue to trust in the blood of Christ if they even hope to have any salvation when Babylon falls. So I guess it's not as uh, developed as what you're bringing out, but those, those are thoughts that we've Head along the way. Okay. Uh, before I call on uh, Brother Russ, I will say, in order to accommodate that explanation, which which I will say uh, has has well, we never really uh, delved into it too much. We just heard, we read what the pastor thought, and we read what other uh, brethren thought, and listened to their discourses and things. Um, and you have to, in order to arrive at any of that understanding, have to compartmentalize everything as different pictures at different times, and nothing is beholden to like a chronological timeline as far as chapters one through six are concerned, because obviously the ancient worthies are not on the scene leading anybody when, when Babylon is destroyed. You know, that, that's leading up to that point. So again, it gets back to, I, I personally think there's a, an explanation that allows us to follow a, a I've come to this, this uh, thinking anyway, that allows us to follow from chapter one to chapter six, uh, and, and you know, not take each picture out of time, out of sequence, and apply different things to it. And that's, that's where I'll say we're kind of uh, introducing a, and we don't have all the answers, by the way, so there are things that are good questions that, wow, that, you know, that's interesting. What does it mean, the, the recircumcision? Well, is that the great multitude um, like doubling down, you know, rededicating themselves to after the church is off the scene, et cetera. I mean, or, or is it related to natural Israel, et cetera? Uh, Brother Roscoe. Well, the bread or it, it is associated with Jesus, the, the, the merit of his uh, sacrifice. So that, uh, legally speaking, would, would cease, I would think. And uh, the merit of that sacrifice is complete. So Adamic death, in effect, is taken care of as a illegality. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so the Christ had, you know, this, like, like was mentioned, the sin offering is complete, and that, uh, and again, keeping with the, the theme of uh, the chronological ordering of things. I mean, the other explanations sound nice, and, and, and in I don't see that they violate a principle, like what Brother Rick was saying with regard to uh, the ancient order of these and the lead and et cetera. Uh, principally speaking, it sounds nice, and uh, there's a lesson in there and that that kind of thing is that the if this is a picture which I, I don't think there's any dispute it that whether or not it is um, do, how do we uh, uh, explain the, uh, the picture now if we look at it from through this new lens as it were especially chronologically speaking uh, sister Alba. are we saying that the man ceasing represents the body being complete uh, the that is one potential explanation. I think and that's what repeat, we're, repeat what she said. The, the manna ceasing being the completion of the body or the Christ. 
and uh, that's it. That's correct, right? Is that what, is that what we're saying? That's, uh, I think that's one uh, possible explanation. Um, but remember, manna was bread come down from heaven that fed the Lord's people while they were in the wilderness. And as soon as they get over on the other side and celebrate that, their first Passover in their new land, um, that manna ceases the very next day. The very next day. Uh, Sister Rochelle. Might it be that this, um, that spiritual food will not be obtained in the same way by direct, by revelation, but rather that it will be dispensed differently? So it you know some type of a change in the way that people are fed spiritually. Okay, we'll bring out one potential uh, correlation because now again we're talking about these different uh, types that represent the little flock and the great company and Elijah and Elisha and the uh, salvation of Lot from Sodom uh, and those type of things but also in the wise and foolish virgins what happens to the foolish? What do they need to do? Yeah, they need to go on their own through the sweat of their own brow, as it were, and, and at great cost to themselves to go and buy more oil, and which they do, and they come back. Uh, I don't, again, that uh, might be a loose time. Sister Sonia. Yeah, I always kind of sort of have a monkey wrench. Um, so when I'm thinking about the manna ceasing, also I'm thinking in reference to Jesus saying that I am that bread, and if you eat a bit, you'll live, because your father ate of manna and they died, so the cessation of manna now means that you can't live. So that's the way I'm looking at it, that it's, a, it's the preparation for life. The cessation of that manna is the preparation of life, because now Christ is the antitypical man. So essentially it represents, uh, let's call it a, a change in dispensation from the uh, I don't know if dispensation is the right word, but I think at this point, clearly the church is off the scene. The church is no longer in the flesh. Um, and the Christ is complete head and body. So that, supper, that, that manna came down specifically, uh, antitypically or spiritually speaking, I would say, uh, as a benefit for to develop the church class. To develop the church class. That's, that was the primary spiritual application of the manna. Not, it wasn't for everybody. It was uh, for the church. Once the church is done, there's no more need for it to come down. And then we got in a little bit into the legalistic aspects of the, uh, if, the if the head and body is complete, then, that, then it can pass on, you know, it can be applicable to the world of mankind. Uh, let's move quickly. Manna ceased. Uh, Brother Rick brought it out. Joshua. By the way, what's uh, uh, Joshua's name? What is that? It's Jesus. Joshua's name is Jesus, or Jesus' name was Joshua. Or, or, look at it. Um, we won't go into that, but then he has this encounter with the captain of Jeho the host of Jehovah, those last few verses in, in uh, chapter 5. Um, that is probably a study in and of itself. I mean, there's a lot of uh, uh, thinking behind that in uh, the pastor, um, various uh, brethren who have uh, studied it greatly in depth and I do you know it's a very interesting account because all of a sudden Joshua looks over and who's there it's a man with a sword and he looks pretty imposing and Joshua's first thing while well, you here for us or you know against us uh, is, and Joshua tells him or uh, the, the captain tells him who he is and then all of a sudden Joshua uh, you know prostrates himself and we have this account now that uh, I would say one potential Submission would be in that picture. Joshua does not represent Jesus. He represents, you know, an element on this side of the veil. Uh, who is given the credit? I'll say, or the, the individually speaking, at least in the Elijah, really Elisha picture, even though he gives the credit to Elijah for uh, destroying Jezebel and uh, all the worshippers of Baal and the uh, royal seed um, of, uh, who, who is that? Jehu. Jehu. Um, believe it or not, they're kind of actually close. Their names are fairly close, Jehu and uh, 
you know, Hoshua or whatever, you know, you know. Um, but it's interesting that uh, Jehu, I don't think, represents the Lord. I think it's, uh, he's a different element. He's an element, a class, an element, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Joshua is given, uh, essentially is given a, uh, a word of encouragement, and he's the one that's responsible for the destruction of Jericho, and he leads a force. He leads a, an army. And of course, you know, we have Cyrus in Babylon, um, that is typically also associated with Jesus, you know, coming under the gate and infiltrating. But there, I think there's more to that because I'll ask this really quick question, even though we have like 10 minutes uh, maximum if I take extra time. Uh, we did start late. <laughs> we, we did start late. Um, was, technically speaking, and I'm going to ask this of Brother Richard Doctor, technically speaking, did Cyrus destroy Babylon? Somebody needs to hand a microphone to Brother Richard. Technically speaking, Cyrus took it so quietly that the people needed to be informed the next morning that it was taken. The um, city rose up in rebellion against the Persians about two generations later. And at that time, the siege uh, ended with the destruction of the city, the breaking down of the gates, the breaking down of some of the walls. And, it, uh, and, and then Baghdad was established essentially as a trade center in Babylon. Uh, ceased to be a significant uh, player in the Middle East. But no, Cyrus did not destroy it. He took it very quietly by night. Okay. A bloodless coup. A bloodless coup, essentially. I mean, it wasn't bloodless for the, for the princes in, in uh, Belshazzar, but for the population in the city itself. Like he said, you know, they woke up the next morning and they're like, wait, what? Didn't, weren't we just, you know, <laughs> we were just having a nice party. And who's running the show now? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, Brother Rick. No, I was just going to mention about Darius the Mede. But that's what okay, Dar yeah, Darius the Mede, which came uh, a little bit later. So yeah, so uh, Cyrus did not destroy Babylon. Babylon remained intact for actually a considerable amount of time. In fact, Daniel and the uh, return of the Jews, that, that actually took place a couple of years. It took some time for uh, them to ascertain. Remember, uh, by the account, I forgot the way it's worded in Daniel, he says, but by the, like, the reckoning or accounting or whatever of years, we stumbled, hey, wait a minute, no, now's the time. We, we need to start going back. And this was uh, a little while, so a fair amount of time had passed between the uh, overthrow of Belshazzar and the uh, conquest in that bloodless coup. Um, okay, so the captain of the host, uh, is an interesting, and we could take time on that, but we don't have it. Let's run, we're gonna have to run really quickly now, and I was hoping we're actually gonna be able to read chapter six, but that's not going to happen. Uh, Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. Uh, sounds like Babylon. You know, they were in their walls feeling pretty secure that, hey, as long as we're in here. Also, what else does it sound like? Who else felt pretty secure in their walls until they were destroyed? What's that? Uh, Jericho. Well, Jericho, but I mean, who else? Who else? Later on. Jerusalem. Yeah. And who does Jerusalem picture in that picture with uh, Zedekiah at the helm and when they're destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar? Don't they picture? Babylon, Babylon, but they felt secure inside their walls until the siege took its uh, toll and uh, people were bargaining to eat each other's children. Um, and Jehovah said to Joshua, see, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor, etc. And he tells them what to do. He says, compass the city, all ye men of war. This, it's a little confusing. Uh, how exactly things happen, but once you read through the entire account and you do it carefully, 
um, you, you come to, uh, you know, you get, a, you get the picture, in other words. But it's easy to actually be confused and, and get the wrong idea on certain things. Uh, the Lord said unto Joshua, have given, okay. Uh, verse 3, and ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. And seven priests, this is where it gets really fun, seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. Also, those are jubilee horns. Um, there's a debate, and it really doesn't matter. I don't believe in the, uh, in the type or the antitype. Uh, some argue that, well, these were the silver jubilee trumpets. Others will argue, well, no, those were made later on. It's, you know, they were established in the land, and these were really ram's horns that they used for jubilee trumpets. Uh, just a, a, an aside, because that comes up when you read commentaries. So we've got seven priests, seven trumpets, and seven days. And on the last day, they encompass the city seven times. So they encompass the city a total of 13 times when you read the account, if that's what you get out of the account. There's a, a difference of opinion on that, too, and, and I don't think at this point we don't either have the time or the inclination to go into it. Uh, it comes to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. And that's essentially where Jehovah's instructions end. Joshua's instructions to the people are more comprehensive. They're more comprehensive. Uh, and Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said unto them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant. And let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord, of Jehovah. And he said unto the people, Pass on, encompass the city, and let him that is armed pass on before the ark of Jehovah. And it came to pass when Joshua, and I'm, I'm flying through this because we're at time, really. We only have a few more minutes. Um, it came to pass that when Joshua had spoken unto the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of the ram's horns passed on before Jehovah and blew with the trumpets and the ark of the covenant of Jehovah followed them. So, think about it. The first day they made one circuit and either they were blowing the trumpet as they were going around. There, there are three options here. I don't see them as being... Uh, a problem any way you want to slice it. Either they started out by blowing and then they made the circuit, or they made the circuit and then they, depending upon how you read it, um, it sounds more like as they went around the priests were blowing the trumpets on the first six circuits. <clears throat> and then we have day seven. We have seven circuits and seven blowings and a shout. Or do we? Let's read it quickly here. Uh, and the armed men went before the priests that blew with the trumpets, and the rear word came after the ark, going on and blowing with the trumpets. Which makes it sound like they were blowing as they were going. Uh, Joshua commanded the people, you shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout, then shall ye shout. Another interesting point. Any ideas? Share them. So the ark of Jehovah compassed the city, going about it once, and they came into the camp and lodged in the camp, back in Gilgal. That was the first day. Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord, Seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them, but the rear word came after the ark of Jehovah, going on and blowing the trumpets. And the second day, they compassed the city once and returned to the camp. So they did six days. Out. They had a, a very specific order, progression. The, the fighting men, armed men went first then the priests and the trumpets and the ark, and then the rear word, the people. The people were behind it. Uh, there must be something in this, uh, what do you want to call it, in this uh, the order of procession. They did that six days and returned to Gilgal. Came to pass on the seventh day, they rose early about the dawning of the day, and compassed, that's, isn't that interesting? They rose early about the dawning of the day. On that seventh day, the dawning of the day, compassed the city after the same manner seven times, 
Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass in the seventh time, when the pre priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for Jehovah hath given you the city, and the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein, and Jehovah uh, uh, therein to the Lord, only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in her house, because she hid the what? The messengers. The messengers. I had a lot of that interesting. The messengers. She hid the messengers that we sent. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest you make yourselves accursed, and you, etc. So we, we understand that. But the gold, the silver, the vessel of brass and iron, they're going to be consecrated unto the Lord. Isn't that interesting? Uh, antitypically, that, that's kind of, a, I think, has an interesting portent to it. Sister Carrie. Yeah, it's interesting because those are the same metals that are used in the image of Daniel. Yeah. So, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, that seems kind of interesting. Uh, and this isn't the only place this happens, by the way, that we also find out in uh, Ezekiel that all of the stuff that the invading horde comes down with essentially gets repurposed and retasked into uh, like holy duties. But as you had mentioned, um, we've got silver, gold, brass, and iron. And they just happen to be the same elements that are in the uh, image, that the image is comprised of. Uh, again, we don't, we really don't have any time to discuss any of this now. And this is the, really the salient point where there probably should be a lot of ideas flowing around on each of these verses. So the people shouted and blew trumpets that came to pass, and the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. So that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. They utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep, ass at the edge of the sword. But Joshua said unto the two men that spied out the country, go into the harlot's house, bring out thence the woman and all that she hath, as ye swear unto her. And so they went in and they did that. Her father, mother, her brethren, all that she had, they brought out all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. And they burnt the city with fire and all that was therein. And then they reiterate, only the silver, gold, brass, iron, they put it into the treasury of the house of Jehovah. Uh, Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive and her father's household. And Joshua adjured them at the time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that riseth up and buildeth this city Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn, in his youngest. So what's the uh, ultimate uh, destination, the ultimate um, well, yeah, destination of Babylon the Great, Mother of Harlots? What's that? Uh, perdition, perdition, yeah, I mean, annihilation. And not only that, are we sorry? Is it a sad thing that Babylon is destroyed? Does anyone, should anyone feel bad that the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church is going to burn with fire and her smoke is going to rise forever as a, like a testimony, as a people are going to walk by and wag the hand and say, as, you know, and all these things. I mean, there's nothing favorable said. So if Jericho pictures that, then that's why... Uh, Joshua is saying Jericho is a curse of the Lord and everything in it. It's, you know, that he hates it. He hates Jericho. Uh, antitypically speaking, Babylon. So the Lord is with Joshua's famous noise throughout all the country. Um, and of course, I think that country is Eretz, is that land, yeah, throughout all the land, which can be applicable to a very specific geography or the entire uh, globe, for that matter. Um, okay. There's a lot, and I'm sorry we didn't get to it. Uh, it's poor time management on my part, but it's a big subject. Like I said, we're trying to introduce a different line of thinking as far as the chronological procession of these events and when they even cross over and begin to circle Jordan. We think that is yet future, a future day. Uh, what are the six days and the six trumpets that precede the seventh day with the seven like rapid circuits that happen all on one day? Are the seven days equal to, is it a day for a year? Is it like a seven year period of time? Um, are the six 
first trumpets. Could those be? This is completely a, a it's not even an opinion, it's just a, a thought. Could those first six trumpets, what, what, what do we have six of that to us are extraordinarily important as Bible students? Volumes. Volumes. We have six volumes. They're extraordinarily important to the Bible student. What in the future do we have seven of that happen in fairly rapid succession that are devastating to sister? Yeah, what, what do we have oh, seven? That was my question. Could they correlate to seven plagues? But are also supposed to destroy that one. That sounds like a very reasonable suggestion to me. Um, and it's a, it's a symmetrical, it's a, nice, it's a nice symmetrical fit for me. Uh, and then, you know, who are the, the seven priests? Who are, are they the seven angels or is it something different? You know, does it, do they represent something else? Uh, so we've got, you know, seven days, six circuits, one, you know, one a day, then we've got seven circuits, we've got seven trumpets, we've got shout, the people shouting, and then the, the, the destruction, all the people shout, and the walls come down. But she's not destroyed. Only the walls come down when the people shout. They actually have to go in and do the destruction, and Rahab is saved out. Now, what the interesting, if you look at the account, guess what? The walls fall, they go in and get Rahab, and then they go in and they burn the city. So there is a, a there is a, uh, a you know a, a logical order to the way things happen. So anyway, that's it. Um, more like I said, it raises more questions than answers, but it's a wonderful topic. Hopefully, it'll elicit some study, and if you come up with more answers, uh, I'm all ears because this is we're not done with it. Probably gonna need a part two. Okay, so uh, we're. Past plenty of time, so just close the prayer. Uh, Brother uh, Rick, before we do that. Just as Sister Kate, well, sorry, just as Sister Kate's question, a quick point about the uh, the four metals uh, of the reference to the image. One might just demonstrate that to the Lord, all that had been considered glorious of these earthly kingdoms that have suppressed the Lord's uh, people will actually redound to Him, almost like His trophy case in a in the best. The word just showing his dominance in the end. Yep. He wins, they lose. And the other would be just the element that the people that were under those kingdoms, uh, the, the Gentiles that were under those kingdoms, will actually end up returning to the Lord. That's what he's interested in, was the people who had been suppressed by them or under them. He actually gets them because it's the people he's really interested in, obviously, not right. the stuff. Yeah. Okay, good points. All right, um, I'll close with a word of prayer, and then we then it's lunch. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you for all of your wonderful blessings. We ask your overruling, uh, especially anything that's been said amiss. We do want the truth, regardless of our own uh, predilections or thoughts, and we ask that uh, all these things would be revealed to us, if it be your will. Uh, we ask your uh, blessing on the provisions and the meal to follow in our fellowship. We give you thanks for it and for everything. We also ask that you'd be with Sister Rachel, that if it be your will, she would receive a re recover and measure and that uh, she would also be able to um, fellowship with the, uh, the brethren as well. And we leave all in that care and keeping. And again, ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.